Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Marie Vino, the president and CEO of Mayo Hospital in Dover, Foxcroft, Maine. Dover Foxcroft is located in rural central Maine, and Mayo Hospital is the primary hospital for the 17,000 residents of Piscataquis County, which covers a landmass roughly the size of Connecticut. Prior to coming to Mayo Hospital, Marie worked at Millinocket Regional Hospital in her hometown of Millinocket, Maine, where she rose from staff nurse to president and CEO. During her tenure, like much of rural Maine, the two paper mills that were the economic engines of her community closed down. We talk at length about what it is like leading a nonprofit community hospital during a time of economic downturn, and how she led the organization and worked with the community to care for her fellow residents. Marie has been the president and CEO of Mayo Hospital since 2014. Mayo Hospital has a unique governance structure. It is a quasi-governmental entity governed by a hospital administrative district, which I was not familiar with. We discuss how this governance structure is different from the typical nonprofit hospital's governance structure and the challenges of working in this different environment. Mayo Hospital is currently in negotiations to merge with Northern Light Health, formerly the Eastern Maine Health System, one of the three largest health systems in Maine, and we discuss some of the challenges of going through the merger process. We close the interview on a discussion of leadership. The full interview runs about 90 minutes. I've produced an abridged version that runs about an hour. This is the full-length version. If you'd like to listen to the abridged version, please see our website, healthleaderforge.org for the link. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Marie Vino. Welcome to the podcast, Marie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you started your career in healthcare in nursing. What drew you to nursing? I actually always wanted to be a nurse since I was a little girl, like five years old. Okay. And, you know, wrote my, you know, junior high book report on Florence Nightingale and just never, never veered from that as a career goal. Um, So when I graduated from high school, I went to, I actually went to um, a diploma nursing school, which is, are mostly not in existence anymore. But I went to um, New England Deaconess Hospital School okay. of Nursing in Boston. Okay. And that was a three-year program. So I graduated from there in 1988. But I really appreciated that nursing program because you got to do a lot of clinical work in premier Boston hospitals, including the Brigham and Women's and Boston Children's. And I don't think we did we did the Deaconess itself, obviously, that had a huge diabetes center. And so it was just... a uh, clinical education experience that, I mean, I have nurses that have worked for me for 20 years now that never saw or never will see in their careers some of the things that I got to experience as a student nurse in Boston. So it was really a great experience. So so you finished your uh, RN, and uh, what did you do after you graduated from that program? I actually worked in Boston for about a year at the Brigham. I went right into the operating room. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, from from there. And I stayed there for about a year. And then I decided to move back to Maine. The The Boston life wasn't going to be for me. I was born and raised in Maine. And um, so I, I came back to Maine in, a, in about a year and a half after I left after nursing school. But I worked in the OR there. Um, and then I and I had originally thought my career goal was I was going to maybe do something in nurse anesthesia. Uh-huh. Um, but I came back to Maine and worked at Eastern Maine Medical Center for a few years in between about eight, 89 and 90 and um, realized that I kind of thought the CRNA role might be boring for me. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so I decided to leave that and that uh, 1990 is actually when I went back to my hometown of Millinocket, um, which is in northern Maine, and I went there as a staff nurse um, in special care. So I went into ICU. 
So you went back to Millinocket and worked at, at Millinocket Regional Hospital? Yes. Yep. In 1990. Okay. And so I worked in special care for a couple of years, and then I became a nursing supervisor. And shortly after I became a nursing supervisor, the special care unit had failed its joint commission survey. Oh, no. So they asked me to take over the special care unit and get it through joint commission, which I did, and then continued that role for a few years. But by 1994, the chief nursing officer had left and had recommended that I, I be named the chief nursing officer. I, of course, we had an interview process and application process, but I became the, the chief nursing officer in 1994. For the hospital? When I was only 26 years old. For the, for the whole hospital, yeah. not just for the... Yes, yeah. Wow, 26 yeah. years old and chief nursing officer. Yeah, yeah. So it's a small hospital, but okay. it was... Um, so I've been in administration since. So okay. I, I never never looked back from being in admi- some form of administration. So that was a big, big leap for a young person. Yeah. And it was a, it, it was a small hospital. At the time, we were considered a, I think, 42-bed hospital. And we, we transitioned to critical access many years, several years later. But, you know, the chief nursing officer role was challenging. We had a very active nursing union. And so I had to learn negotiation and, and dealing with labor agreements and, you know, quality of care in rural areas and retaining enough nurses to provide care. And it was a, it was an interesting role. Well, let me back you up a little bit. So Millinocka, tell me about, uh, tell me about your hometown and kind of the area where uh, Millinocket Regional was is, is still located, I assume. St- yeah, it's still there. Yes, it's so. still there. Um, so Millinocket is, I think, geographically almost in the center of Maine, but Maine is a very large state, as you're probably aware, and there's not a lot of population north of Bangor. Millinocket, it was known for a couple of things when I was growing up. One is that it had two paper mills. Um, one in Millinocket and one in East Millinocket, and really the lifeblood of that region since the early 1900s had been the paper industry and the logging industry. Okay. And it also is um, where Mount Katahdin is located, which is the end of the Appalachian Trail and the highest peak in Maine. So it's it's a tourist attraction for many many hikers. So that's where I grew up. So you're, uh, you mentioned paper mills, so I, I have a bad feeling uh, about that for the town. Uh, yep. Because uh, uh, I, I know, so I lived in Bucksport for a little while when I was a kid, and I know they lost okay. their paper mill uh, a while back. So is Millinocket, does Millinocket still have paper mills, or is that is that gone? They do not. Okay. So kind of interesting story, um, which jumps ahead, but I was, I had become the permanent CEO at Millinocket Regional in 2002, August of 2002. And the the first bankruptcy, the original bankruptcy of the Great Northern Paper Company in XCON at the time was in January of 2003. Okay. Um, And I remained the CEO through several iterations of openings, closings, reopenings, um, but they are both now permanently um, gone. The Millinocket Mill has actually been destroyed. And the East Millinocket Mill is is sort of sitting vacant and half taken apart. Wow, and I mean that's a lot of the story of a lot of the industry, and in, I know in Northern New Hampshire as well as as up in Maine, right? A lot of kind of deindustrialization, loss of these kind of big employers in the communities, right? And when I where I am now, I can tell you more about when we get to it. But mm-hmm. they they had also gone through a similar loss of industrial jobs. Um, several years prior to the Millinocket losses, actually. Um, so, you know, challenges all around in the state of Maine, for sure. And I think if you, you know, you mentioned that you lived in Bucksport for a while as a kid. So, you know, there were so many mills then. And now I think you can name, you know, on one hand, the amount of paper mills left open and or running in Maine. Wow. Uh, it's an amazing change in, in our lifetimes, you know, to see all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about the transition. So this is going back a bit, but, you know, you made a pretty rapid transition from, uh, you know, from being staff nurse to to supervisor to senior leader in the organization. Uh, What was it like making those changes? I mean, so what was it like making the like the jump from 
from staff nurse to supervisor, and and you said you did that kind of in a time of turmoil. Your work area had had difficulties. What was it like trying to take over? You know, as a young person trying to make that transition from kind of individual performer to uh, to supervisor and and making organizational changes. You know, at the time, it just seemed natural to me. I do think that it was a little bit difficult to go from colleague to leader over people that were, you know, often had been there much longer than I had or or were friends of mine. But for some reason, it, it didn't ever really cause, cause me a great deal of difficulty. I think that people, I, for some, you know, I, I just, I've never been a... Um, the word I'm trying to use is autocratic type leader. You know, I was always able to build a team and take people forward and was pretty gentle with my communication style, even though I might be delivering difficult messages. And I think that they just respected that. And so, you know, I, and I was one of the, you know, I, it was easy. It was kind of, I don't want to say it was easy. There were always difficult things sure. in, in the, the day and in, in leadership, but it was really, in a smaller organization, it's really easier to know your employees, know everyone, know their history, know their background, and, you know, come from that, come from a place of knowledge about them when you're approaching them about difficult issues so that, you know, it just makes it so you know everybody, you know, it's it's like a family and it, it is a small, it, it is a pretty small facility. So sure. I was having come from within, I knew everybody and it made it, it made it, I think, less challenging to create network and help people to make organizational change. I'm not saying it was not tough time. Yeah. It, there were plenty of tough times, but. Yeah. What advice would you have for, I mean, so, you know, I teach primarily undergrads uh, here and you know they're going to be heading out into the workforce and making that transition from from individual performer to supervisor and you've you've now been uh, a senior leader for for many years. What advice do you have for people making that transition? I'm thinking back to when I first became the CNO, and I think a few things that were successful for me were to um, no, don't shy away from conflict. Always have the crucial conversation. Have them face to face. You know, develop um, develop those relationships um, because they're important. You can't you can't manage via email, right? Um, which a lot of and a lot of you know. And I'm thinking back to the the, the scene I'm thinking of in my head as I'm t- I'm saying this is, you know, I the union was unhappy with me over something. I, I'm not even sure what now. Very shortly into my tenure as the, the chief nursing officer. And so I had to go to the union steward and I had to go to her work site place and I had to sit down face to face with her and say, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what I can do to make it better. And, and what, do, and how can we work on this together? And we came to an agreement about how we were going to fix the situation we were working on at that point. But that builds that builds a relationship and builds respect for the future, so that the union just isn't sitting over there, or whoever you're having a conflict is isn't just sitting there, you know, stewing about the situation. They feel empowered to pick up the phone and call you and say, "Hey, you know, we had we had this discussion. What can we do next?" So build those relationships is is really important. So you became the the CNO very early in your career. What was it like kind of moving again from supervisor up into senior leadership? It was difficult for some because there were other more senior people in the organization that, that wanted to, wanted to have my job and they were, they stayed on in my management rank. So I have to say there were, that, that was very challenging to manage their emotions and their relationships because they were not happy. To have been overlooked and and um, had someone younger um, and newer to the organization take their role, and I have to say that those those relationships did not go well to the point that that ended up that those individuals did not stay with my organization long term. Okay. Um. So had to manage that conflict and 
not allow them to disrespect and undermine your position. Um, and so that's challenging when you're new in a role and you know that everyone doesn't support you. Yeah. And you have to, and you have to manage, you have to manage that to either the point where they feel like they can support you or you make a change such that they're no longer with you because you need a team that will work with you. I think the best part about that was that the rest of the senior leadership team greatly supported me and gave me a huge amount of mentorship to to help me to be successful in my role, including there was a, a, a long-standing chief operating officer at that hospital who kind of took me under her wing, and I'm very grateful for her to to have, you know, always guided me. Um, so having senior leadership was very supportive and mentoring um, of me. So you were the CNO, and and how long were you the CNO? And and, and eventually you did. You said you transitioned uh, to be the CEO in in 2002 as a per, as a permanent CEO. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in about um, 1997, I think I became they they named me the chief operating officer and chief nursing officer, and so then I took over all of the clinical operations of the hospital, not just the nursing operations. Okay. So all of the other ancillary clinical areas, you know, radiology lab, OR, cardiopulmonary, all those things, pharmacy, all reported to me. And then I think we had a CEO transition in um, 1999 or so. And I became interim CEO at that point um, for several months while they recruited a new CEO. I did not apply to be the CEO at that time. Um, but I had actually did have board members approach me and ask if I would apply, and I, I said that I didn't feel like I was quite ready to do that. And so they recruited a new CEO who came at the end of 1999, and he was only there until the um, early summer of 2002. Um, okay. So I became interim again at that point, and then the board chose decided not to do a recruit, and they offered me the position. And you felt like you were ready to do that at that point? I did until I found out the mill was going bankrupt. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I did. And so okay. I took the job in August of 2002. And I have to say, that's just an extremely fortunate career path. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't say how grateful I am that I had a grew up board and a group of people around me that had such faith in me that they didn't even feel like they had to bring in somebody else to compare me to. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's just, that's, that's, I'm re that's really fortunate. So I think I was, um, you know, I've worked hard. I've been a good leader, but it's also, there is something about timing and being in the right place for sure. Sure. So, Let's talk about uh, the hospital as you had it. Uh, so you said at the at some point it was a 42 bed hospital. Then it became a critical access, which means it came down in size, at least in licensed beds, right. it came down. Um, right. So when you took a, took con, took charge of it as a CEO, how what was the? Uh, give me a sense of the size of the organization and and uh, you know, beds, employees, and so forth. Yeah. So um, when we became, um, when I became the CEO in 2002, we were actually mid process to becoming a critical access hospital. Okay. Um, so we about September of that year had found out that we would be approved to be a critical access hospital, but at the time you had to have, you had to have a special survey, and they they held your payments until the, you became a. You got a new Medicare number, which becomes important when I talk about the bankruptcy and the financial distress. Mm. So we, at that time, had about 300 employees, I think, two, maybe 280 FTEs. Um, we had, for, sur for specialties, we had only, you know, a couple of primary care clinics, probably a total of five or six physicians in primary care. Uh, we were definitely going away at that point from anybody in independent practice. The CEO prior to me had bought the last independent position group and brought them in under the hospital's wing. So most everybody worked at the hospital. We had orthopedics. We had general surgery. We shared an ENT, and we were working on getting a urologist to share with my now current hospital and another hospital in Lincoln. So we had few specialties, but 
over and overall, we were pretty small. We had a medical staff of probably less than 20 okay. physicians and non-physician providers. So it was a it was a fairly small place. The service area was about 10 to 12,000, and that's smaller now. The population of Millinocket at the time was probably 3,500 or maybe 4,000. So, it had already greatly contracted from its yeah. heyday, so to speak. So it was already on its way down because of uh, uh, the the loss of the mills had started, or was that? Yeah. So the job losses at the mills actually started when I was in high school. Okay. So mid to late 1980s, there were layoffs probably each year, and so by the time I was a kid or in high school, it was. This used to be the thing where the place where young men didn't think about going to college because they were going to walk down over the hill and get a job at the mill. Right. That's what they did. Right. And by the time I was in high school, it was already pretty well known that that wasn't going to be the future you wanted because there were already, it was already contraction and job losses and, and so much competition in the market and international competition in the market and that kind of thing. So, so the town was already starting to, to lose population even as you right. graduated and, and started your professional career. As I was a kid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. So, and how did believe that... me, I, I personally never thought I would go back to my hometown. You know, every 18-year-old says, never coming back, <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah. But I, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I said the same thing. I, I left New Hampshire and I said, I'm never coming back. And here I am. So. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So how is that affecting the, so how are the changing circumstances affecting the hospital? Um, well, we actually, we did really pretty well financially um, through most of um, my early years there. We had, um, you know, we had, we were, we were managed, managed by Quorum. It was a hospital, hospital management company out of Tennessee and they, they did, they managed a lot of hospitals in Maine back then. Um, but so we did pretty well in the first several years, and the board had done really well in the 80s, and had really thankfully saved saved a fair amount of money because the at the time that the mill was at its peak um, in the you know 70s, 80s, 90s, they basically paid us cash. We, I mean, charges. They didn't. Okay. They were. They were self-insured and or it, whatever they had for a commercial plan. I mean, the discount might have been one percent. Okay. So we had such a lucrative relationship with them as our insurer, and of course, the largest insurer of all of the population that the, the hospital did really well. So right after I took over, unfortunately, was this time period where we were waiting for the critical access data to come through. And we were waiting for the mill owed us $1.6 million that we noticed them stop paying on their health plan. Oh, wow. Um, about October, November. And so they, my CFO and I, who is currently still with me, she's here in, in Dover Foxcroft with me, but that's oh, another story. Uh huh. Um, she and I were sitting around in, in December when they announced a two week hiatus shutdown for the holidays. And we were in her office saying, and I'm looking at her and she's looking at me and we're saying, they're never coming back. We know they're not coming back. And they didn't come back. They declared, they filed bankruptcy in the beginning of January. Oh, wow. So we lost that $1.6 million. And we also, so about a third of the population became uninsured in one day. And that was because not only did the thousand mill workers that were currently employed become uninsured, but every retiree in that community had some sort of prescription card or insurance through one of the prior owners of the mill that all, all of a sudden was gone. So it was a very challenging time. So all those benefits that had been promised just were just gone. Or right. Even, even Retirement, from the retire oh. insurance, wow. pensions, all of it. That must have been catastrophic for the community. It was. And, um, you know, there were, so the hospital kind, you know, the, of course, when those things happen, and I think they're fairly practiced now here in Maine, but that was one of the first ones. So Eastern Maine Development Corporation and different agencies try to pull together and put supports in place for these people and, you know, help them to meet their basic day-to-day -day needs and get unemployment. And um, I, 
you know, I just, it was very impactful for me to watch this community struggle because I don't, I, I don't know. And I, you know, you're, you're going to have college students that have had the good fortune of going to college and getting an education and being going out into the workforce. But these, if you think about um, these people, and I've seen it over here too in, in Dover, the Dover Foxcroft area, they had a high school education and they went to work and they made good money and it was all taken away in one day. And how do you process that? And because you don't have, you know you don't have a lot of options because you never got the education and unless you can find another mill down the road to go get another job, you, what do you do? And it was, it was really, it was really heartbreaking in some instances to see how difficult it was for some people to deal with that loss and depression. But then there were others that looked at it as an opportunity and took the retraining dollars and went and became a nurse or a police officer or a scrub tech or something else and looked at it as a new, new career opportunity. But it was a really interesting time to be running the hospital because not only were you dealing with the financial losses of the hospital itself, but you were also looking to the community and realizing, you know, they didn't have any health care. And so we went to bankruptcy court and advocated for an interim health plan for them, which we succeeded in in getting and worked with our local congressman to get some grant money to, to provide some preventive services in the meantime until the mills were purchased or people were back to work. So the hospital played a really big role in in this whole process, even though we really have nothing to, had nothing to do with manufacturing. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a huge policy impact that you had there. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was um it was really and I said to somebody over here in a community forum last week. So I managed Millinocket Regional Hospital through the bankruptcy of their largest employer in 2003, and what I'm managing right now is even harder. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so they lost. You lost. You said there were two mills. Um, was that the yep. first one to go down at that point, or was or was that or had one already gone at that point? No, they both went on the same on the oh. same day. Oh wow. Um, okay. And. One was in Millinocket and one is in East Millinocket. The two towns are about seven miles apart. Okay. They had always considered themselves separate entities, really, which is sort of funny. And they still consider themselves separate towns. They have not merged in any way. They they both went down at the same time. And when they were purchased, they were both purchased again. But I, I lose track of which one permanently closed first. I think the Millinocket Mill permanently closed first. Um, but they, they went through about three iterations of different owners and, you know, opening and closing and, and that kind of thing. But they, they since have both been shuttered since, I think, yeah. I could be wrong, 2010 or 11. Okay. So it was kind of a start stop. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was pretty... up and down, never back to its prior employment levels, but uh-huh. it was up and down. Um, but also never back to our, um, you know, the, the, of course, the, the benefit of the health plan never, you know, came back to the level that, that we had been accustomed to. So we spent, you know, we had to learn how to live on cost-based reimbursement. And, and I mean, where, whereas before you had been getting, uh, we had a fairly big cat, you know, yeah. yeah, we had fairly good cash flow. Yeah. So, yeah. so suddenly, so suddenly much, uh, much leaner operation or required to be much leaner. Um, yep. I mean, what was the, I mean, 1.6 million, losing 1.6 million, I'm, I'm guessing the, your, that's, that was a significant impact on, on your annual, uh, uh, revenues. I'm, I'm guessing, you know. Yeah, we had a big loss a that year on the operating line. I can't, I can't remember yeah. for the life of me exactly what it was, but we actually, we lost money the year of the bankruptcy, but we actually pulled things in and by the next year, had did not have a significant layoff of employees and did make money on the operating line again the next year. Wow. So we were pretty proud of that. And I have to say the one thing that happened that probably saved us is that the physicians did not leave. 
Okay. Why do you think they didn't leave? So they were just loyal. Yeah. And I, and I think that's unique. And I'm, I'm not saying there aren't loyal physicians, don't get me wrong, but I had this very core group of physicians who had only come to the organization, say, within the three years prior, and they were had young families, and they and one was a general surgeon, one was an orthopedic surgeon, a very strong family practitioner, a very strong internist, and, you know, a couple of other longer-term docs who had been with the hospital for, you know, their entire careers, 20 years plus, and they, they stayed. And they could have left. And I was particularly worried about those with the young families looking at, okay, major employers gone, erosion of the schools. Are they going to get a good enough, are kids going to get a good enough education? But that core group of doctors stayed and continued to take care of people. And I think that the community owes them a great, great debt of gratitude because that's what allowed the hospital to succeed during those times. So you wrote, I mean, so you rose within the organization to become CEO. You know, you made a fairly rapid rise to CNO. You were in that role for a while, then, then to COO, and then ultimately to CEO. And you were CEO for 12 years as permanent? Yes. Yep. Yep. So um, I was. what was it like moving up, you know, in the same organization, starting as a staff nurse all the way to CEO? I mean, I, we don't see that all that often. So, <laughs> um <laughs> So, I mean, and granted, it was a smaller organization, but but it's still, I mean, that's still a significant leadership role. Um, what was it like to make that, you know, make that full transition? Um, it, how can I describe it? I'm I'm trying to think back. Um, you know, I I felt supported, it, so I I felt that people um, wanted me to have that role. Um, and respected me in that role. The transition was, I guess it felt natural at the time. Yeah. And I had a very, very strong and supportive board. I think, you know, of course it's challenging to come from within the ranks and, and be the CEO, become the CEO. But in some respects, it, it's, it's challenging in a couple of different ways because, you know, it's, and sometimes it's easier to walk into an organization and I've, having had that experience here where you really don't know anybody and sometimes you can see the forest through the trees a little more than you might be blinded by things that have always been in front of you in an organization that you, that you rose up through. But it was, it was challenging. It was gratifying. But I have to say that, you know, I did a, I did the work to get there. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would assume so. And, you were invited to do it. so Yeah, so I did. And so I guess, and, and what I would say to students that, you know, I I didn't ever have to be asked to do the work. I, I volunteered. Yeah. So, and I think I've, I heard somebody at ACHE, it might have been Diane Smalley that said, how did you get to be CEO? And she said, I volunteered for the, I, do, I volunteered to get here, meaning... You know, I just had that attitude that whatever needed to be done for the hospital, I probably could tackle it, and I would volunteer. So if there was a problem with infection control, I'd take that over and fix it. If there was a problem with the quality plan, I'd take that over and fix it. If we had a survey that didn't go well, I would tackle it and, and do the work and, and get it done. So, um, you know, you don't don't wait to be asked. Just volunteer to to do what the organization needs. And that will be recognized. And and I think that there weren't that many people like me in that organization. So that was apparent to leadership yeah. and the board. Yeah. And that's a consistent theme that I hear from a lot of, you know, leaders. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Robert Mock, who, who you know, uh, you you knew knew from uh, ACHE from, from being up here. Yep. You know, he, uh, when I talked with him, he, he said how... I said, well, how'd you get to where you are? As, you know, he was uh, sort of COO, I think, at Littleton. And he said, well, I, I raised my hand. Every time there was something that needed hard that needed to be done, I raised my hand. So it sounds like it's kind of the, the same message you're saying. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I remember Rob. How, I, he's, is he out in Michigan now or something? I think so, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, I liked him. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that's 
and the other piece that I think that, so I, I, well, I guess I can't leave out the part about being a clinician. Right. So, um, that, that probably is important to talk about because, um, really when I became the permanent CEO, it was, um, due to, um, one part, one piece of it was the ringing endorsement of the medical staff for me to, to be in that role. And, um, so I think, uh, it, it's not a requirement for, it's not a requirement for anybody to be a CEO in healthcare. It's not. But in my particular career, it has made a difference that I've been able to walk there or talk their talk. And so I had, I had a lot of very, very strong backers on the medical staff just based on the work that I had done with them because some of them, most of them I had been in the trenches with. Most of them I had worked a night shift with or handled an emergency with at some point that they respected my clinical skill as much as my administrative and leadership skill. And that, that, that was important for me at that time. I mean, and that's definitely a trend, at least that we're observing and I'm observing as I look at, you know, senior leadership, particularly in, in healthcare delivery. So hospitals, Mm -hmm. uh, large clinical organizations is, is, is kind of a move toward clinicians in senior leadership roles. Yeah. And I know like, you know, here, um, I, I know a lot of larger organizations are certainly seeking position leaders. Right. And, and that, you know, and I'm sure that's challenging because uh, there, A, there's a shortage of positions anyway. Um, but to have those that have leadership experience or have been in a leadership role is sometimes hard to find. Yeah. But is that, but a, that was, that was important to me. Important to you because, uh, uh, because it gave you a unique experience or, or a unique relationship with the providers that in your organization, or do you think, or, or I mean, now you're, you're no longer at Millinocket, you're, you're at Mayo. Uh, does, does having that clinical experience still impact the way you lead? It does. And I think that my, Chief Medical Officer, who has been here the longest, I, my my quality officer, my medical officer have been here the longest, and they they um cons they tell me all the time that there's a difference between a, a traditionally trained CEO and a nurse CEO. They see the difference. What what is the diff? What is it that they see? Um, I I I guess it would ha I'd be hard to articulate, but I think. I think what Dr. McDermott would tell you, who's my chief medical officer, is the, just the, I don't know, just the attentiveness to the workflow. And I mean, I get involved there. I'm, it's not every day. Believe me, right now, the merger takes up most of the airspace in my life, but I'm on the units. I get involved with when they have difficult patient situations that they need, you know, input for. I get involved. I know, you know, I know the staff. They know I can talk their talk that I'll, you know, they don't hesitate to reach out and run a clinical situation by me if they need help. Just that type of thing, I think, is what they see to be different. I don't, I don't golf. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, that I was, don't say that to be crass. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought that was an essential skill. I'm, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, no. So I, I just think that I'm more hands on with the staff and the patients, or I, I try to be, I do have to say that's been a part of the challenge of my role in my new job, in this job that has taken me away from some of that day to day, checking in on the staff, talking with the staff, knowing what's going on with the patients. When this place is just that little bit much bigger that, that um, some of the challenges have made that more difficult to achieve. So you, we've talked a little bit about the, changes that were going on in the community around your hospital you were then you were there from 2002 to 2014 so over the course of the next 12 years both uh well both facilities ultimately both both mills ultimately went bankrupt did that leave uh the hospital as the largest employer in town or or was there were there other still large it is still business? no it is still to this day the largest employer in that area yeah and it was, yep. So once Ever the since. mills were gone, yeah. So, so, yep. How did, I mean, what was, what was the impact on the hospital, on the mission of the hospital, 
uh, as you know, as the mills finally kind of became clear they were going away and not coming, you know, and and not coming back. You know, how did that impact the health of the community? How did the hospital? How was the hospital involved in that? Well, so it we were the, we did become the largest employer, and I do have to say that um, there was a there was a great. Um, Sort of maybe not new appreciation, but there was a great appreciation for the hospital um, after that. Not that they didn't appreciate the hospital before, but certainly did not to the level of value. Now that they're standing there saying, "Oh my gosh, this is our last great piece of infrastructure that we have," um, and so people became very attentive to the hospital and aware of the hospital. The hospital also did a lot of work in the community to try to help. So my role as a CEO, of course, um, that was the one, the one big change from COO to CEO was the community piece. And, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but um, someone that has never done, has always been in operations and kind of inside the building and you right. know, making sure things run well on a day-to-day basis. And you become the CEO and all of a sudden, whoa, you're the face of this organization. Right. And you need to be out in the community. And so <clears throat> I did a lot of work on economic development. I was the president of the Economic Development Council for a period of time. I served on many task force forces and vision committees and things, you know, how do we recreate the community? How, you know, how do we recreate this area um, to be vibrant into the future? I, you know, rotary, um, raising money, funds for food banks and, you know, local charities and that sort of thing. So my world was very consumed with being out in the community and help, trying to help people um, to find their way after this, you know, tragic event. But my employees actually were very involved in the community as well. And, you know, every year they put on a free variety show for people in the community and it was packed every year. It was like a whole evening of and they didn't charge a dime. They could have raised lots of money probably, but they just wanted to do it for the community because they they wanted to make people laugh because it was a tough time. And, you know, they did that for something like eight years straight. I mean, wow. it just, um, people got, the employees of the hospital just became very involved in the community and and really all trying to help each other. Unfortunately, when I left, it was about 10 years in, a little over 10 or 12 years in, I guess, to to all of that work. And unfortunately, we had not seen a lot of forward motion in people accepting that the mills weren't coming back, that the next major manufacturer wasn't coming down the road, and that we really needed to transform ourselves to really accept the fact that we were going to be more of a tourist-based economy. I have to say now, thankfully, even just five years later, they have made some progress in that area, and there is a bit of some hope and a, a little bit of a resurgence over there. So, yeah, so that's good. Great. Well, let's. Um, so, in 2014, you you transitioned to uh, Mayo Regional Hospital, where you are today, the president and CEO. What drew you from Millinocket to Mayo? Um, so the CEO, uh, the long-term CEO at Mayo was a friend of mine. Maine is a pretty small state, and we had, um, and we knew each other very well through working with the hospital association and different, different group organizations. And he was re- planning, he announced his retirement in about 2011, and he called me and asked me if I would be interested in coming to Mayo. And, at that time, I said, uh, you know, I still have some kids in high school, and I don't know, and I, you know, it's not anything I really ever considered. So I didn't, I didn't transition at that point, and they, they hired a CEO when he retired who only stayed about 10 months. And so after that, the recruiter called me and said, hey, you know, have you, have you considered, would you consider Mayo now? And I said, you know, yeah, I think I would. So, so I did, I came over, um, and I, um, ended up, you know, interviewing here at Mayo and I had one child left who was going to be going into eighth grade. So it was a good time from a family perspective for the transition. And I knew a lot about the organization from Ralph, the prior CEO. And I always thought that it was 
a well-run, well-respected organization and well, well-liked by its community, et cetera. So I have, so I got, I got offered the position and I came. Okay. And in February of 2014. Um, and the reason I, I just was feeling like, you know, like I said, it was sort of feeling in Millinocket like we're not going to make any progress on this economic development please. There's nothing to grow. Yeah. You know, I, so I was feeling like I needed the next challenge. And Mayo is quite a bit bigger and has some service lines that, um, that we don't, that we didn't have in Millinocket and it's quite a bit larger from a medical staff perspective. And so I certainly thought there were, were things that I could learn and challenges that I could take on over here that would expand my career. So, and you, so been, I may, yeah. Yep. Uh, and you'd been, and at, I've been, no, yeah, Millinocket for what going on 20, 20 years, 20 years. I got, I got my 20 year pin before <laughs> I left. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so for those folks who aren't familiar with, uh, Dover Foxcroft, uh, and Maine in general, um, tell us a little bit about, uh, Dover Foxcroft and, uh, and how Mayo fits into that community. So, um, Dover Foxcroft is the county seat of Piscataquis County. It is, it borders Sebec Lake, um, and, Piscataquis County is the largest county in Maine. It's actually the size of the state of Connecticut, and it has about 17,000 people in it. Size so, of Connecticut and 17,000 people? Yeah, in the county. <laughs> okay. So wow. Millinocket's service area was about 10,000 or 12, maybe 12 at its peak. Uh-huh. So our service area has about 22,000 when you, when you go off to, um, Northern Penobscot and Northern wow. Somerset counties, which we also serve. So there's, it's much more of an agricultural area than the Millinocket area was. Okay. It has, a, you know, a lot more farming. Um, but it had lost its major manufacturing in probably the early to mid to late nineties. They had furniture manufacturing was big over here. Dexter shoe was here. Okay. Those were all well gone before I arrived. So the manufacturing base over here is actually better than Millinocket now, but there's still, but it's much smaller. There's a couple of wood products, a wood products mills around that have, you know, 150 to 350 employees, you know, just two of those. There's a textile mill um, in the next town over that has a few hundred, you know, a hundred or so employees. So we're still the largest, the hospital's the largest employer. Um, in the region here oh. as well. So, mm-hmm. so that's, um, definitely one of our, you know, well, it's not, it's a challenge. We don't, don't, I always said, I've always said my entire career, I don't, you never want to be the largest employer. When you become the largest employer, it means there's something going wrong with your region, but, or with your economy. But unfortunately, as a state, that's true for most of the state of Maine. And I, I think that's particularly true in northern New Hampshire as well. When I, you know, travel, uh, uh, when we travel up into the North Country, that's true. Right, right, exactly. In most rural areas, it seems, that's becoming true. Yeah, I think it's even true for Bangor, uh, which oh, is oh wow, okay, a statement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bangor is yeah. one of the larger so, cities in 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 Maine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so so here I am, and okay. it's it's been challenging. So we'll talk about kind of some of the uh, challenges that you're going through, but let's get a sense of, of Mayo as a system. So there's the hospital, and then you have um, Mayo Practice Associates? Yes, we have five rural health clinics that are geographically dispersed around in the communities surrounding the hospital. Um, and we have on the main hospital campus, we have our specialty clinics, which include general surgery, ENT, urology, uh, women's health, obstetrics, and GYN. We did have cardiology for a brief period. Orthopedics, we have a pain serv- a pain management service. We have a run an occupational medicine program here on campus. We also have a psychiatry and counseling center, which is across town. We, we have psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, as well as a, a large group of counselors. And we run the EMS service for all of the Scatacus County, or for most of the county, and some of Northern Penobscot and Somerset as well. Wow. 
And then the hospital itself is a critical access facility? We are, yep. Um, so we're critical access, about 25 beds. We are 25 beds, but we have still about eleven to 1,200 discharges a year. So we're about, as compared to Millinocket or a few of the other critical access hospitals around here, we're about double the size probably in revenue and discharges at this point. Okay. And and one of the things that, I mean, you mentioned you, you had briefly had cardiology. So, I mean, keeping specialties in a small facility is a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, and I noticed like, from, uh, so looking at, looking at your annual report, uh, I saw you had uh, cancer care, for example. Yep. Uh, 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 which kind of surprised me in terms of actually having that in a small facility. Do you have, it, it, do you have, is the, is your um, oncologist on staff there uh, full time or is this a no, shared so, asset? No, it's a shared service. So for 20 years, we've been, our oncology clinic has been staffed by oncologists from Northern, from Eastern Maine Medical Center, Northern, which is now Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center. Okay. And so they come up once or twice. Now they come up twice a month and do the oncology clinic days. And then under their supervision and the supervision of a local internist, we do the care on the interim. So we just expanded that unit last year due to a grant and a, a, a gift, a donation from a local resident. But it's all, it's, it's staffed by oncologists from the, the medical center. And then you mentioned uh, obstetrics. Um, I mean, a lot of facilities have given up obstetrics. Given your remote location, that's a, an important service to provide. How is that? Uh, I noticed you had 121 births in 2018. What's it like trying to maintain um, a service like that with a relatively small population? It's it's challenging. <laughs> um, so 100, uh, yeah. So we've been hovering right around 100 to 125 births for the past several years. Um, we had some turnover in obstetrics in my probably 2015. And we're taking some time to recruit a new OBGYN and the expenses to cover the service with locums cost us almost a million dollars that year. So it's not something that you could staff long term without permanent providers. I think the thing that has been the saving grace for our obstetrics program is we do have now a committed OBGYN who really likes it here and is planning to stay. And we have some, we have several family practice doctors who did OB residencies. So, and one of those who did a C-section fellowship, so she also does C-sections. So that that's really the only way we're able to have any kind of economy of scale to be able to cover the call. The, the, the call burden is a big sure. issue for, you know, rural areas because, of course, in these days, people don't want to be on call every weekend or every other weekend. They want to have a more you know, work-life balance. And so that's really what has been al- allowing us to keep obstetrics going. Our board is very devoted to obstetrics. They they really don't want to lose that program. Um, it's, we would be, you know, we're 37 miles from Bangor, um, which is not too bad, but the next, I mean, there's not a hospital north or west of us that does obstetrics. So, there are people that are 90 miles from Bangor yeah. um, that come here to deliver babies um, that would have another 40 miles added onto that trip. So yeah. um, the board feels very strongly about that. A point you're making about, like uh, you have a, you, you mentioned your your uh, OBGYN physician who's committed to being there. What's it like trying to recruit physicians to come to a rural hospital like Mayo? It is um, extremely difficult, and so we have, in fact, last just last week, we closed one of our rural health clinics in Guilford um, because we could not get any providers to staff it. We had had staff turnover last summer, and we we simply we did not have one physician candidate in the in the pipeline to even begin to talk about working in that clinic. Um, it was losing money. We were staffing it with locums, and um, there was access from another clinic, from another provider down the street, and so we had to close it. We probably, you know, we if we we have an easier time getting non-physician providers, 
we still have a fairly strong, we still have a very good ratio of physicians to non-physician providers in the primary care clinic. But I, we actually, several of the last several physicians that we have recruited have been foreign medical graduates. Okay. And we, we rely pretty heavily on that program. Hey, t- talk briefly we, about that program. So I don't think I've ever had a guest kind of explain the value of that. Okay. So, so each state has a certain amount of what are called J1 visa waivers, um, which means that you can take a foreign medical graduate who has recently completed residency in the U.S. and bring them to um, on one of those waivers to work at your organization. And that waiver is transitioned to an H1, what's called an H1B visa, which is a professional visa. And so Maine has 30 of those visas avail- available to them every year. And it used to be that you wouldn't even use all 30 in a year. Um, you know, you, the state, you might use 15, you might use 20, but we never used all 30. We are so reliant as a rural state now on that program that the program, the visas open on October 1st each year. And last year on October 2nd, all 30 were gone. Oh, wow. So that's how tight it is to even be able to recruit a foreign medical graduate. So, but these are individuals that have gone to medical school in their own country, many from, from everywhere, but, you know, um, high, high from, uh, India. I actually have, I'm on, I have three staff members that are from Jordan and, but also other, I mean, I've had, you know, some from the UK, Canada, any place really, but that they have come to the U.S., they've done their residency in the U.S. that makes them board eligible so they can sit for their boards. And um, they, the H-1 program requires them to work for in a rural area for three years post, post-residency. Okay. So that's how we get them to come to work for us in rural areas. And we've had success with that. We find that they don't leave in three years. They, in fact, I think mine have stayed on average five to six years. And now in this day and age, for a provider to be in one place for five or six years is really pretty good. You know, I... I certainly have the population around me, the elderly population that wondering where's my doctor that's going to be here for 30 years and take care of me, but that that isn't really how it's working most of the time anymore. So do you rely so you, you mentioned you uh, have had some luck with getting non-physician providers, so nurse practitioners, PAs, I assume is what you're referring to. Yep, yes, yep. Yeah, so you know, we probably recruit three or four new non non-physician providers a year. Um, we use we rely heavily on non physician providers in a rural hospital. So our um, our anesthesia staff is all CRNA. Our ER staff are primarily PAs. We run our hospitalist program at night with nurse practitioners, MDs during the day, but um, nurse practitioners at night. Our primary care practices have about one doc to two to a two NP or PA um, ratio. So we, without non-physician providers practicing to the top of their licenses, we would be very challenged in a rural area to provide access. I believe I noticed on your website that you are now working with Dartmouth Hitchcock and their telemedicine program to provide support to your your emergency department? We are. Yep. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, I actually... um, I met Peter Hammond, I think through through a ACHE or NNEHE conference, and started talking to him about the program. Brought it to my staff uh, probably a year before we implemented it, and um, got some pushback from the ER providers. Now we don't really need this. You know, it's expensive. Why do you want to do that? But then started having some further contracting of services that were available 24 hours a day, one of them namely respiratory therapy. We were no longer able to provide that at night. And the providers themselves came back to me and said, you know, we really think this could be valuable. So I worked with Dartmouth Hitchcock and we went live last October with the tele-ED program. And it's actually used fairly heavily and been a great support to my ER nurses and my ED providers. Um, So we would coin it a success. What does it do? 
for folks who aren't familiar with so, it. It's so it's a program where, um, you know, we have a couple of our emergency room beds are wired with um, basically microphones and a, and a TV camera, um, and they push a button um, when they need help from the, bri- from the bridge, I think it's called, um, at Dartmouth. And at night, it's actually provided by a company out of um, South Dakota, I think, a national company. But in the daytime, it's actually the docks at Dartmouth. And so when you push that button, they come on and you have immediate access to a certified emergency nurse and a board-certified emergency physician. And so this is something that you would use for patients who are more critical, so perhaps a trauma patient that has come in, perhaps a patient that's needing to be intubated or having a mass, a, a, a heart attack, um, that you, it's like bringing a sec, second set of hands or eyes immediately to the bedside without being without deploying more staff so they can help you verify drips they can help you think of you know what step you need to take next they can help you um, look up protocols they can document for you if you don't if you need them to do that and they also you know help the providers by even calling other facilities to get the patient transferred in a timely fashion Given the the success you've had with that program, have you been looking at other telemedicine programs to expand the the um, care that you can provide? We have um, we already have another a telemedicine program for psychiatry um, that in our emergency department. So um, with our local psych, psychiatry facility, um, Acadia Hospital, which is one of Northern Lights hospitals. And so we do telemedicine um, evals and treatment of psychiatric patients in the emergency room who are awaiting beds, um, which sometimes is for a lot of days to to get a placement for care. So they're actually receiving some care here by the prescription of the psychiatrist, et cetera. So they're not just sitting here not receiving care and waiting. So we already do that. We have looked at the Dartmouth ICU support program as well, but we haven't moved forward with that at this point. Uh, we're teaching a, a telehealth program here at, or we're developing a telehealth program here at, at UNH, so it's always interesting to me to hear how that's actually being used in the field. Shifting gears a bit, you, you talked, uh, uh, you mentioned a number of times how supportive your board of trustees was uh, back at Millinocket. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of the Board of Trustees and how you as the CEO interacts with the board and, and what does the board do? Um, here or in Millinocket? Uh, <laughs> they're very different. Okay. Uh, well, maybe theoretically, what it, what is it they're supposed to do and um, what's your experience has been between the two? Well, so Millinocket was a traditional not-for-profit 501c3 organization, which means the board was nominated by a nominating committee and selected of members of the community that were recommended to them and, you know, interviewed and then nominated and brought on the board. So you would have, you know, your variety of bankers, lawyers, accountants, a nurse, a doctor, but they were um, all serving on the board as volunteers and they were self self nominated to so to speak so over at mayo the the structure of the hospital is different in that it's a hospital administrative district it's called oh okay and it was um, so it's a public it's a quasi governmental hospital it's the equivalent of working with uh, say a, a school board or okay. a board of selectmen but there but over a hospital so the HAD has 13 towns, and they elect their board members at town meeting. So it it off it just depends who runs for the board. I I just was operating on the assumption you were a 501c3 when I was asking you this question. So that's really an interesting uh, organizational form. So is Mayo a governmental? You said it's kind of quasi governmental. Uh, is it just the way that they're is it just the way that um, the hospital bylaws are written that this is how the board is elected, or is it is it the nature? No, um, it was it's the nature. So it um, back in uh, it's exact. It's actually how the hospital was the district was formed. Okay, 
1973. Um, it was formed by a, a special purpose law of the legislature of the state of Maine. And because it is, and there was another one, there was a had HAD1, um, which dissolved in 2002, which is what was Penobscot Valley Hospital, or is Penobscot Valley Hospital um, in Lincoln, Maine. But uh, so it was formed by a special law, and the reason that it was pursued, it's governed by a charter, and the charter is eclipses the bylaws. So if something in the bylaws doesn't agree with the charter, the charter rules. And if you, if I believe the purpose of forming the district was so that the hospital could access lower interest debt through the main bond bank, I see. as opposed. To, opposed to having to go to the market. And if you think about the 1970s and what was happening with inflation and debt and yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. you can see what their motivation yeah. would have been. Interest rates were in double digits. So that, that does make Correct. sense. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So so it was really done primarily for that reason. It, it, it hummed along really fine for all those years. Um, we just had our 40th anniversary last year. So, so you've been, you've, you've mentioned, um, this merger with Northern Lights uh, a couple times here. So, so, and, and in the context of kind of the board and, and the, and the stresses there, why is Mayo, uh, exploring and in the process of merging with, with Northern Lights? What's the motivation? So when I, so when I got here, um, in 2014, the board had had a very big, uh, strategic planning session right before I got here in 2013. And the, you know, they had worked with Stroud Water on that. And they, they were pretty clearly told at that point that since 2010, your operating margins are compressing. Um, you're, you start, you've been losing money for a couple of years now. You still have a strong balance sheet as an organization, but, you know, you're a rural hospital and you really should think about what's happening nationally, what's happening with population health, and think about finding a partner. So when I got here, they had me work with, we were working with Covenant and St. Joseph Hospital, which is a smaller hospital down the road from us in Bangor. And we, so we, we partnered with them a little bit. We were working with a local FQHC to do some collaborative things with, with an ACO. We shared a physician with St. Joe's, a surgeon. We shared a, we shared a orthopedic surgeon as well. And we were kind of just sort of feeling our way to see if we could collaborate enough to improve the bottom line without actually going to pursue a full affiliation. But the board had another mini retreat, strategic planning retreat in 2015 with the medical staff um, in November. And they, the same group came back and showed them the numbers again and said, it's getting worse. If you want to merge or if you want to find a partner when you're anywhere near a position of strength, you should be working on that now. So they came in and in that very month in November of 2015 to their board meeting and they voted to pursue a a request for proposal and find a partner. And they did that. They did an RFP. We asked every system in the state, um, which is four, to bid on the proposal and only two did. One was Northern Light, which was Eastern Maine Health Systems at the time, and the other was St. Joe's and Covenant. And so months of vetting of both of the proposals and meeting with both teams, et cetera, um, the board then voted and chose to enter an interim agreement and plan with um, Northern Light Health. And so we've been working on it since 2016. Okay. And going through multiple iterations of education and you know, negotiation and due diligence and fit and, you know, all of those things that you go through before you get married. And so we're at the point this year, but so we've got to the, we got to the point this past summer where we were going to sign an, the final interim agreement and get ready to sign the plan for merger. That's really our best option to a future of financial sustainability. The system has a hospital 37 miles north and west of us that's smaller than us. That there's another one. We're kind of right in the middle of a triangle for this system. And so to, to erase competitive 
uh, competitive competition and have be working in collaboration with the system um, would certainly, we believe, be a strategic advantage for Mayo and for its clinical care. So in addition to becoming a collaborator rather than a competitor, uh, what is it that becoming part of Northern Lights would do for Mayo? We Well, we believe it would make us clinically stronger. We have we already have a lot of services that we share with them that, you know, they support our pharmacy, they support our sleep lab, they support, uh, you know, they provide our air ambulance and trauma support services. Um, it, it's a very long list, but we feel like that collaborating with them would give us access to a larger pool of physicians, larger pools of staff that could help us with our very difficult situation of recruiting and retaining staff. We already are trying to share some services with um, Northern Light CA Dean, which is the hospital in Greenville that I mentioned. Um, but we also would be able to rely on them to provide us with a lot of support services for things like our health plan, our malpractice insurance, things that we have a very small pool that's very costly for us to provide that they can provide in a cheaper way, better employee benefits plans because we're struggling to keep up with the market, you know, regulatory support, legal support, all things that as a small hospital when you're trying to do these things on your own, um, you know, MIPS comes down and you, you go, who am I going to assign that to? Right. You know, better payer contracting. I mean, it, it's really a long list of advantages to the organization. Yeah, because I mean, we talked about, you know, you're, you rely on trying to reach uh, foreign medical graduates. You're using a lot of extenders. So it sounds like being part of Northern Lights, you'd have access to their – you'd have access to their administrative expertise and kind of broader Absolutely. base of support. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, so for example, um, my – my CFO got sick last year. Um, so on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I found out I wasn't going to have a CFO for eight weeks in the middle of the budget. Um, you know, I had no one to play to put there. Right? And I, imagine, I had nowhere to go. I imagine this and is so, not a deep shop of, with lots of bench. Exactly. So, yeah. so when you're in a system, you call the system, and there's already somebody down there that already knows your financials, knows your books, and says, fine, I'll help you close the month or I'll help you finish the budget. Whereas, you know, you're going out, you're looking for an interim, you're paying a lot of money, um, you, you don't, they don't have the expertise that you need, they don't already know your organization. I mean, the bench, the bench depth alone in some of the areas would, is, would be of extreme value to us. Uh, so, will this, uh, it, where is the merger at as, as we speak? It's, is it being held up now or are you? No, uh, so we, in order to change the charter to allow the merger to happen, we need legislation. Uh -huh. And so we're working with our legislative delegation. So, but there, there's some language in the charter that talks about the community's voting. And so what we're having this week is advisory votes at town meetings in all 13 of the communities. So tonight I will be in another community at 6.30 to talk about this, and, and they will vote on whether they are in favor or against the merger. If enough communities vote in favor of the merger, we believe the legislators will then file additional legislation that would allow um, – the, 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 the charter itself doesn't address the merger that doesn't allow it to happen. We need a separate bill that basically says how the merger will happen and – that the charter will will no longer govern um, in order for the merger to take place. So that's where we're at um, in each. It's very challenging because there are pros and cons, and it's a it's a very um, hot community debate right now. Well, I, I hope I, I wish you luck with that process. That sounds uh, sounds difficult. Uh, let me uh, let me just ask a couple of questions to to wrap up. You've been a CEO now for 17 years, give or take. Um, yes. What have you learned in that time um, about the role, and how has your leadership evolved? Oh, uh, well, you know, I can say that it. I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to sound down or anything about the role, but 
it's a challenging role because you truly don't have a peer in your organization. So it's kind of, it's a little bit of the it's lonely at the top thing. Sure. Do you know? Mm-hmm. The buck stops here. Um it really it's not it's not like that every day, but you do have to have the fortitude to be the person that makes that final decision. It it's a it's a very large responsibility. And on a, on a, any given day where it you know things are going along routinely and finances are pretty good and you know you've got enough providers and you know you're not looking at closing a program or merging or things of like that it's it's usually fine you don't think about it um but when um when things get tough it's it's a it's a role that you have to really build your team around you that you trust, but that you still know that there really is truly not a peer. You are, you are the person that needs to, to, to lead and be an example to the rest of the organization. And that's challenging at times because we're all human. You know what I mean? Right. You want to have a bad day. You want to not smile. You want to say, yeah, how are you today? Well, I, it stinks. That's how I am today, but you can't. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, um, and so I think I've matured as a leader a lot in going through many of these things. Um, but I still I still always am challenged as a leader. Um, you know, at, you always can communicate more. You always can be more present. You always can listen more. Um, and I just, you know, continuing to hone those skills um, every day for 17 years. You know, it's just, you can always be better. You can always be a better leader. Um, if, as a CEO, what keeps you up at night? Hypothetically oh. or, or, or metaphorically. No, everything. Or, or literally, I guess, maybe. <laughs> you know, everything that, um, you know, uh, the, the whole, um, gosh, we just talked about this at a conference too, but so... You know, and these things sound, of course, you know, things like the financials and that the reimbursement's never going to get better and you're not going to have enough money to recruit, you know, have enough staff or those things always keep you up at night. But I, I'm i worried about um, health care in my community. There's not, it keeps me up at night that I have a, a, a lot of patients upstairs right now that have dementia that are elderly, that don't have any family members and they don't have any place to go. Who's going to take care of our population when, when that, because that's going to continue to get worse. I worry about the people that have mental illness that, that don't have anywhere but my ER to go and they might be on the street when they leave. I just, I worry about the whole like structure of the system. Do you, does that make sense? It does. So macro concerns um, really hit you as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I just, that we, that we're never going to be able to do enough, especially in the rural areas, to, um, to take care of the population because our resources are so limited. And that's why it's so important for us to do this merger to bring more resources to this rural area. And, and it has really been keeping me up at night that, if the merger doesn't happen, I look at what I think will happen if if we don't merge, and I know that my patients and my employees will lose. Do you have an articulated leadership philosophy? I don't. I don't know that I do. Okay. Um, I mean, I think I try to be a servant leader. I don't uh-huh. think I've ever had a can, you know, a thing yeah, in my can. head that says, you know, my leadership style is. Blah. I, I think it adapts based on the situation that you're in. Um, I mean, I heard you talk about listening and communicating were, were important things to you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, you have to. And and again, to engage your workforce is, I think, one of the most difficult challenges as a CEO. Um, the culture, you know, and and promoting patient safety and the culture of safety and 
you know, getting everyone rowing in the same direction on that. You have to listen. You have to communicate um, because, you know, what this is a dangerous business. Yeah. And if and if we don't get people thinking about patient safety and the culture of safety, then then, it, you know, people can get hurt. Um, so that's why it's been so important to engage and communicate. And I, I am proud of my staff here. And I mean, we've done a lot for pay, with patient safety over the past few years. And, you know, we have patient safety huddles three days a week and, you know, very engaged, um, board and medical staff that talk about patient safety first at every meeting, every agenda, um, really have a great organizational focus on that. And, um, I really appreciate that, um, about my staff. They, they helped me to lead that effort because you can say you want to do it, but you need, you need employees and, and, le- and department leaders and board members and medical staff members that will engage in that with you. And, and we've been successful in doing that here. And I'm very proud of that. What, uh, what do you look for when you're hiring a leader? I, 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 some of the same, some of the same skill sets that they're going to listen, that they're going to um, be good communicators, that they, that they can engage with people, that they know how to um, work through crucial or difficult situations with particularly providers and, and non-physician providers, that they care, um, that, they're, that they could be loyal to the organization. Most of the young people that I teach in my undergraduate program are young women. Um, what advice would you have to them as they go out into the field seeking to be leaders in the healthcare, uh, in the healthcare industry? Wow. Um, so I would have to say that as a young woman, I probably didn't do the, what do they call it? What do my providers tell me it's called? Work life balance. <laughs> Uh, I've heard of this very thing. well. Yeah. Okay. Huh? I've heard of this thing, work-life balance. Yeah. yeah. It's something. Yeah. That's it's, it's that thing that my providers keep talking about, and oh. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> I didn't have that. I'm from a different generation, you yeah. know. But yeah, I do think it's important for them to make sure that they don't put so much into their career that they lose anything else, that they lose any of that balance of of family, life, self-care, it's very hard to do, especially if you are aspiring to a position like mine where, you know, you feel like you've got to, you've got to be the one to always say yes because you, you want, you want to get that promotion. Um, but it's, it's really important to, um, it's really important to remember to take a step back and take a deep breath and, and take care as well because i think i think disproportionately well i know disproportionately that if you're a woman in a leadership role you still are expected to be mom wife daughter at home and and those are it's difficult to balance all of that and i and that's probably not the answer you wanted you probably wanted an answer about leadership and work no. um but really that that has been the thing that i've struggled the most with is to balance all of that. Yeah. You know, I have four kids. Wow. I, you know, I had very ill parents. I took care of all of them all at the same time that I was being a CEO. So it's important to, it's important to learn to, to do that. Uh, so last question for a young person, male or female, considering a career in health, uh, why should they be looking at healthcare administration? Well, I, I, you're, it's never boring. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but you know, it's rewarding. It, you, it's a career where what your job entails is to take care of people and, and to provide them, you know, to take care of people when they're often at their most vulnerable moments in their life. And it's very rewarding to do that. And I think that healthcare administration is something that, um, is, is just always going to be there. However, the changes in healthcare, you know, are in our country in the future. Um, it, people are always going to need care, and it's it's just a career that you can you can do so many different things. It, it's not it's not a 
you know, pigeonhole career. I went to school to be a nurse and I'm, I'm, I'm nothing like a nurse right now. And I've had multiple different levels of my career along the way. It just, it's very exciting. There's lots of opportunities. And if you want to help people, it's just, it's a great, it's a great place to be. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I, I could keep talking to you for a while yet, but I, I know you've got things to go do. So, so thank you and, uh, uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.